Good morning. Uh, can I welcome everyone to the 12th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee? And can I please remind everyone present to turn on mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is a decision on whether consideration of a draft report on the LCM on the Higher and Education Research Bill should be considered in private. Are members consent, content that we consider the draft report in private at a future meeting? Thank you. Agenda item two is the third of four sessions on the committee's pre-budget scrutiny. Earlier this month, we had heard from Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. This week, we have the Scottish Qualifications Authority, and next week, we will hear from Education Scotland. I welcome to the meeting Dr Janet Brown, Chief Executive, and Linda Ellison, Director of Finance of the Scottish Qualifications Authority. Before we start, I'd like to put on record the committee's thanks for the SQA hosting a visit for Fulton McGregor and Ross Thompson last week. I understand Dr Brown wishes to make a short opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as the National Awarding and Accreditation Body for Scotland, SQA is responsible for the quality, validity and maintenance of the credibility of qualifications offered to learners in Scotland. And given the size of the accreditation function compared to the awarding body, we fully understand that the focus of this committee is on SQA's role as an awarding body. In that capacity, the SQA develops qualifications to support the education and skills system in Scotland. And our remit is to ensure the ability for learners to progress successfully through learning with the qualifications by building upon the previous learning and preparing the individual to be successful in the next phase of learning or into work. SQA qualifications must therefore be set at the correct level and the course content must reflect the knowledge, understanding and skills necessary for achievement of a successful destination for that learner. In the case of Curriculums for Excellence qualifications, SQA was asked to develop a suite of qualifications that build upon the learning and level of achievement of candidates that, would, that they would have received during broad general education. The CFE Management Board approved the design and structure of those qualifications. The course content and associated guidance were developed in consultation with stakeholders from across the sector, teachers, colleges, universities and employers, in addition to professional associations and particularly subject specialists. It should be noted that the nature of the assessments reflected the desire of CFE to provide opportunities for personalization and choice for candidates and for teachers to be able to set the assessments within those um, uh, associated personalization areas. SQA does indeed play a significant and key role in Scotland. However, it's important to understand that role in the education system as a whole. The structure of curriculum models, the nature and number of subjects undertaken by an individual learner or group of learners is determined within a school or college, and the qualification any individual candidate undertakes is a matter for those centres in consultation with learners and parents and carers to support the best interest of that young person. This does not fall within the remit of SQA. The development and delivery of qualifications is a complex process. And SQA takes the approach of trying to ensure inclusion of both professionals in terms of teaching and learning, but also subject specialists and those who will be receiving the learners after they have undertaken and achieved the qualification, namely colleges, universities and employers. We have a strong working relationship with teachers and lecturers across Scotland. Indeed, over 15,000 of them work with us in partnership every year to develop and deliver the qualification system as a whole. As the national awarding body, SQA is responsible for ensuring the standards, credibility and sustainability over time, and in doing so, has to balance the needs of a variety of stakeholders. The introduction of CFE has been one of the biggest educational changes in Scotland. And indeed, that change continues with the recently announced decision by the DFM when he asked the SQA to redesign the assessments associated with national qualifications. As the new nationals have been implemented, SQA has provided additional support and listened and responded to the needs of teachers. The past few years, in the past few years, it has taken significant time in terms of implementation and adjustment for that significant change to become embedded. During the course of the development, there was absolutely an essential need for SQA to communicate as much as possible with those involved in the delivery and learning and the teaching of candidates who have completed a who complete a qualification. And this engagement has continued as the qualifications have been uh, put in place over the last three to four years. 
Our responsibility to understand and address issues is well understood. We solicit regular feedback and receive feedback from teachers and other interested stakeholders. But the nature of our work in some cases means that we sometimes receive different advice from different sectors and different people, reflecting the different approaches of respondents to their subject and the different opinions of the nature of the course content and the, of the approach that they would like us to take. SQA seizes its responsibility, the need to fully understand how our qualifications and assessments are operating in schools and identify any issues that need to be addressed. It was in this vein that at the end of 2015, SQA undertook both a review of the qualification design and detailed field studies to develop a research base and an evidence base that allowed us to understand what was needed to be strengthened and what had worked well as the qualifications had been implemented. That field study involved talking to teachers, senior management teams within schools, and learners themselves to get a full understanding of how the qualifications were operating. We also believe that it's our responsibility to publish our findings so that others within the system can understand the nature of these results. The committee may be aware that in May of this year, SQA published two research reports, one of the field work and one on the detailed study of the nature and design of the assessments. As a result of this evidence, SQA made changes to unit assessments for the current session and communicated these and planned future changes through the subject review reports for each subject again in May 2016. At the current time, SQA is undertaking further study and further field work, again with senior management teams, teachers and pupils, to understand both how these changes have worked to improve aspects of assessment, but also to take further the discussion to understand the nature and experience of implementation of particularly National 4 and National 5 within the school and college sector. We're fully aware of our responsibility to provide value for money to the public purse, and we are focused on the safe and secure delivery of our remit within a decreasing public purse. We regularly review our processes and procedures to identify ways to improve and provide value for that public purse. And we welcome the opportunity today to discuss our activities with the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, full short statement. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your, your statement that you have a strong working relationship with teachers. The online survey that we received and uh, a, a meeting I had with, with teachers would suggest that that wasn't quite the case. Can you explain to me why there's been so many negative comments? I normally wouldn't take anonymous online comments seriously, except for the fact that pretty much everything that they said was backed up by the teachers that we spoke to face to face who were quite very strong in their criticism of certain aspects of the SQA. And can, so can you tell us what has been done over the last year to build this relationship, to continue this, work, this strong working relationship with teachers? And why is it that teachers don't seem to feel that like they have that strong working relationship? I, well, uh, two issues, I think. It, we, the education and the qualification system in Scotland is run in partnership between SQA and teachers. So we have 15,000 of them that work with us every year. Those people are involved in developing the nature of the qualifications themselves, the nature of the assessments that's undertaken every summer. And those people are very supportive and very uh, engaged in ensuring that what we're trying to do is do the right thing for the learners of Scotland. Um, I think that that's a significant number of people. As in any case, when you introduce any major change, such as Curriculum for Excellence, there are things that people agree with, things that people do not agree with. The approach that was taken with CFE was very much to uh, move away from a, a, a prescriptive NAB-based assessment to something that was very much more teacher-driven. That, I think, has proved to be uh, a challenge for some teachers and not something some teachers wish to do. So as we move into the new situation where there will be no unit, unit assessments, that aspect of the discomfort that teachers have found with the approach that was agreed by the CFA Management Board will actually be removed. We also do regularly get feedback. We, we, we have um, received feedback from teachers about what they did like and what they do not like in the courses, how the assessment has worked. And that was partly the reason that we went out last year um, to do the field work, to try and get a better understanding of what that meant so that we could go away and address it. And the subject review reports for every single subject 
were published that told everyone what we were planning to do to change and address any issues that we'd identified. Well, can I just say that the group of teachers that, that uh, Ross Greer and I met covered pretty much, they covered primary, secondary, but mainly were t it was the secondary teachers that we were talking to the SQA, uh, but they also covered varying degrees of experience and they all, I think without fail, had the same complaints about the relationship between the SQA and the teaching profession. And they didn't seem to think it was working. They didn't. They seemed to think that there was an awful lot of... Uh, your response touches on communication, and they seemed to think that communication between SQA and the teaching profession was non-existent, or if it was anything, it was negative as opposed to a positive communication, that they weren't getting anything from it, that uh, it seemed to be more to obstruct them than to help them, and that a lot of the things that the SQA seemed to be putting in place for teachers were done for no apparent purpose as far as the teaching profession was going. And surely either you're doing it wrong or you're communicating badly. Because, either, because that's the only one of two reasons that they could possibly be unanimously telling us that they didn't feel that the SQA were getting it right for them. I think uh, communication, as we all know, is an extremely complicated and challenging area, and it can always be done better. And I will not disagree with that. It shouldn't be, but communication shouldn't be. I mean, if you use if you, if you use simple language, for the, 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 the most simple language to describe the most complicated reasons, the most complex reasons, then it shouldn't be. And, and I accept that you're talking to lots of different audiences, but communication should be fairly straightforward. I, th I think some of the, some of the uh, feedback that we've got in terms of the complexity of our documentation is something that we are looking at. And, we w and one of the actions that we took from the, from the assessment of the National Qualifications Group was to go back and look at that. Yeah, and that sorry, is really sorry Dr Brown, but, and, and I know that uh, Liz Smith's going to come in uh, shortly on this, but, but I, I saw that the previous convener, Stuart Maxwell, had this discussion with you yes. last year. We're having this discussion with you this year. What's happened in the interim? Because, I mean, it is... If it's a complicated issue to, to speak simply, then surely there's been a lot of work being done between last year and this year. Um, there has been a lot of work done between last year and this year. We have a, a specific liaison team that is targeted to every single part of Scotland that we're getting very strong positive feedback on. They go into individual schools and they work with those schools to understand the nature of their concerns, and we, um, we very much act upon that. We get very strong positive feedback from schools on that. Um, I, I think the other thing that we're, we, we have done is we've very much focused on trying to simplify what we're doing and trying to make sure that teachers are aware of the changes. Unfortunately, there have been significant changes. Uh, again, because of our findings, we made changes to the nature of the assessments. That is something that needs to be con conveyed to teachers. Uh, a lot of the complaints that we have had, and I recognise we do have complaints, are around the number of changes that have been made during the course of the introduction of the qualifications. Um, we're about to enter another phase of that, and that will not be comfortable for some teachers as well. It really is keen that we not only communicate to teachers, but we also do to parents and to employers and to the learners themselves. Yeah, the, the, it's interesting you say that teachers won't be comfortable with it, but... As I, as I say, there was a wide range of experiences in the teachers, and I'm sure many of these teachers have been through a number of changes yes. over the years and hey, have very quickly adapted to them. But I'm, I'm glad you mentioned parents, because the National Parent Forum was quite scathing of the, the communication and saying that they couldn't take part in this survey because they didn't understand it. Now, that is... I mean, so it's not just teachers that are affected no. by this, it's parents, and obviously parents are the most important adults in this process because it's their children that you're... You know, the SQA are responsible for getting... We, we again meet on a regular basis with the with the parent teacher with, with um, MPFS and with the uh, the SS the, the SPS, and one of the things that we we make sure we do is try and understand the nature of the concerns of parents and how to make them simple. So we worked with the with the parents council to make sure that we we supported them in putting out nationals in a nut, in a nutshell, which was very much focused around the language that parents would understand. So we do take uh, feedback and we do try and address that as much as possible. The, the, um, we have a parent representative on our advisory council, which is, and that voice is there very much to give us the feedback as to what is working and what is not working. The advisory council is a key component of that whole feedback mechanism. They, they do say, and this is my last comment before I pass on to my colleague, uh, Will Smith, that uh, the submissions from the, the two organisations, 
yourselves in education Scotland, were totally inaccessible to average parents, and I mean that is clearly not acceptable, even if you have a parent on your advisory group. That's clearly not acceptable. There's a lot more work to be done, and I would hope that when we come back here next year, we're not having the same discussion about a lack of communication or the inability to communicate with others. Uh, can I ask, before I, I go to Liz Smith, can we, can, now that I've had my turn, can we keep the questions as brief as possible, please? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the answers. Thank you very much. So we have got a lot to go through today. Thank you. Uh, Dr Brown, I think in my 10 years in this parliament, I have seldom come across uh, a set of evidence that is so compelling in its concerns about SQA. Uh, and I say that with regret. But uh, the messages that we've received in these submissions is deeply worrying, and I'm sure it's a worry to uh, pupils, to staff, and obviously to parents. You cannot be satisfied with what we are being told here. Can I ask you whether you think that the system is fit for purpose, and most specifically, whether you think the delivery of the Curriculum for Excellence is fit for purpose? Um, I, first and foremost, I, I think any feedback that we get that is expressing the level of concern that we've seen in the submissions is something that SQA needs to take seriously, and that is the reason we, we are engaging at this point in time across the country to try and understand what is going on. So uh, I, I do fully accept that. Uh, I think in terms of uh, curriculum for excellence as a whole, there, there as, as we've said, uh, as I've been here several times before, we've discussed that the findings that we identified during the course of our research last year identified multiple reasons why there were issues associated with qualifications, one component of which was the responsibility of SQA. And that is what we're trying to address and trying to deal with. And that is part of the reason why the units have been removed and why we're redesigning the assessment. Uh, I think that the way in which the qualifications are perceived by those who receive candidates with SQA qualifications is a testimony to the value that is, that is put upon them. And I think that is something that we will continue to guard and we will continue to work to make sure is maintained. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure I have uh, much reassurance from it. I, I think one of the consistent themes that is coming through these papers is the fact that people are questioning uh, the process of setting exams. They are questioning the process of marking them. We have uh, teachers here who are making quite a strong comment uh, that they feel that there is a lack of uh, effective scrutiny over this and transparency. Uh, and I, I went back to the uh, committee session uh, of uh, the 22nd of November in uh, 2015, uh, when you were asked about the production of the, the minutes uh, relating to the grade boundaries and the, the actual the way in which the assessment takes place. And you said that you would produce these minutes. Now, they weren't asking for what the decisions were. They were asking for how they were made. In other words, where is the transparency and the scrutiny over the setting and the marking of the exams. That has not happened as far as I can make out. I've been on uh, the SQA website. It's clear about what some of the decisions have been, but there are people who are asking about whether we need much greater transparency in this respect. Could I ask you what your reaction is to this and whether you feel that an independent uh, body of scrutiny would be helpful? I think the way that, um, that we undertake the um the establishment of the grade boundaries in the grade boundary meetings, we have changed the way in which we've reported that. And we've made, we've, we've added more information in terms of the background and the reasonings behind the decisions that were taken. And I think that is something that we, we have published and that is available for every subject at every level. In terms of the scrutiny that, uh, is, that SQA is put under, one of the things that we have within the organisation in the governance structure is a qualifications committee. And the role of that qualifications committee is to ensure that SQA's approach to qualifications development, to assessment development, and to the establishment of maintenance and standards is appropriate. That group is not only made up of SQA board members, but also has representatives from teachers, from colleges, from uh, professional bodies, and from um, assessment experts from universities, both north and south of the border. That group is the group to, which has to approve all aspects of the way in which SQA undertakes its work in terms of assessment for qualifications. So I think that that scrutiny is, is a very challenging scrutiny and is there to be able to make sure that we are doing the right things. 
Well, thank you for that, but can I just develop the point? Uh, John Swinney said in uh, the Chamber, and he uh, replied in a question from me on the 22nd of November uh, in this committee, he said that it was absolutely intolerable to have mistakes in any exam paper and that these mistakes uh, should, uh, if they persist, then that draws into question uh, SQA. Do you agree with the Cabinet Secretary? I believe that we should not have errors in our exam papers, and I have said that before in this right. committee. Why are they happening, Dr Brown? I, I think they are happening because um, people are working extremely hard, and one of the things we've done is, as a result of the errors that have occurred, we have added additional quality assurance steps, and we've got fresh eyes looking at the, the nature of the assessments. The, the, the other aspect we need to do is we need to make sure that everything that is required to make questions within the question papers valid and appropriate, we control and we make sure that we um, have appropriate engagements with institutions that are developing those particular my, aspects. My last point, uh, Dr Brown, on, on this section. Uh, you've replied in a letter to me uh, that there is additional scrutiny for STEM subjects. And you've explained that the reason for that is because some of them have an increasing amount of uh, technical issues. Could you just tell us which subjects are included in the definition of STEM for this purpose and why is it that other subjects are not receiving the same degree of additional scrutiny? I think part of the, part of the issues um, that we've seen uh, historically in, in the STEM, maths, um, computing science and science subjects um, in general is the fact that there, there are technical um, technical aspects to the questions themselves that it is important you have a separate set of eyes look at. So if, if you, uh, I will bring up National Five Computing. So if you're looking at National Five Computing, there is, there is a, a particular program language that's used that um, we need to make sure that we are engaged with and that, we, that was written specifically for SQA. And it is important that that complexity of the nature of that question as opposed to the nature of a, a verbal question that might be set in a social science subject, that that level of technical detail is looked at uh, by more than one person who is of that expertise. And so that is why we're focusing specifically on those areas. Just, just a point of clarification, uh, geography, which has obviously been very much in the news, and one or two, two geographers uh, in these papers have suggested that they're more akin to a science discipline than they are social sciences. Is geography included in this? Uh, the, the whole issue associated with um, uh, when you're putting in complex questions such as um, statistical questions or um, questions around um, uh, equations, etc. That that's what I'm talking about. That, so that happens in economics, for example. Yes, yes. So is so that the, included? So there are very there, there are very specific actions, and they vary by subject, depending on what the nature of the questions is. There is an overarching quality assurance process, though, that is in place, and I, and I want to make sure that you... Could I get some clarification there, Dr Brown, because I'm not really sure if you answered uh, Mr Smith's question. Is geography and, and economics part of this extra quality assurance? Economics is definitely not. Um, geography, I am not, I am not aware of at the moment. Could you you'll get back to us on yes, that? Yes, so I will get back Thank to you on that. Back, I do think, Dr Brain, this is extremely important for the point of view of scrutiny, I, and I think this is a question that parents want to know, um, because you know we have had issues, in which you've admitted this morning, about specific exams, and we cannot go on like this. We cannot have a, you know, an ongoing issue about the nature uh, of some presentations. And it matters about where that scrutiny is, and it matters about which subjects it is. And I think parents have a right to ask if there are some subjects that have this additional level of scrutiny, uh, they want to know why, mm -hmm. and they want to know exactly which subjects are involved and uh, which subjects are not involved. Uh, would you accept that? I think that's a fair point, yes, definitely. Can I, can I just say to the committee, though, that um, we develop a significant number of question papers every year. No one question paper should have any, any errors in it, I totally agree. But there are a significant number of, of, of question papers that are developed every single year. Okay, thank you. Dalton? Uh, say thanks, say, for having us... Uh, over last week, it was a it was a very worthwhile and, and interesting visit, and it was good to see the scale of the the, the work that you're involved in. Um, and certainly, I think I reflected after the meeting that um, that, I, that I felt that you know I learned a lot about what you do, but a lot more you do, you do a lot more than than, than what I had uh, initially thought. 
I think the convener and Liz Smith have already picked up on uh, the line of the line of questioning that, that I was going down as well. There can't be any escaping that the, the submissions um, and whatnot are, are very damning um, for you. And I think you've reflected that. But I suppose what I would like to, to hear is, uh, you know, rather than going over the, the sort of facts again, is, is something more emotional. I, I, you know, can can you convince me? Can you convince this committee that you will you will seek to change? Uh, the nature of the relationship between the SQA and teachers. Um, and, and I think that I, I would like to feel I'd get an answer that I can feel, well, you know, we'll be back here next year mm. and, and this will change. Because I think, I think you could do it. I think you, you are capable of doing it. And the team that we met last week is a fantastic team. So I, I'm, I'm actually appealing more to the emotional side now, because I think we've got you've, you've covered your statement and what you've already said in the, the last two answers. Uh, has kind of covered the facts, but I want to feel convinced. And that, that is the focus of what SQA is trying to do. Um, the challenge for us is to reach every single teacher. Um, one of the things that we, we very much focus on is we, we, run, we run sessions for teachers. We try and uh, provide um, specific requested support. So if a, if a local authority has aspects uh, of um, particular qualifications that they want there, that they feel their teachers need support on, we will go and engage with that. We, we meet with the teachers' unions on a regular basis, and we have very productive conversations about that, sometimes very challenging conversations, but definitely strong communication and strong engagement. Similarly, we have the same thing with the Head Teachers Association, SLS. Uh, we, are, um, we are in the process of revi revising and reviewing how our messages get out. Um, uh, there's feedback, as, as you've seen in your, in your responses, about our website. We are very aware of that. One of the challenges that we need to, to move towards is taking advantage of new technology to be able to, instead of providing long documents that, ha by their nature, have to include all aspects of a particular subject, that we actually break that down and customise the the, the responses that a particular teacher will get depending on the nature of what their inquiry is. That is not a simple and easy thing to do, but it is something that we are absolutely focused on and working on at the moment. So the nature of our engagement with and the nature of our communication to, to uh, teachers is all, also very critical. I think one of the pieces of feedback in, the, in your submissions was also the fact that a lot of uh, information goes through the SQA coordinators within a school. That is a challenging role for, for a teacher to undertake. Um, it w one of the things we need to make sure is that we make it possible for us to communicate with each and every individual teacher. At this point in time, that is not possible for not just our reasons, but also reasons within the schools. So again, it's about customising what information is received by an individual to make sure that they get what they need in the format they need it, as opposed to a very long PDF document, which is the current status. Um, that is something that is, um, is a major focus for us, but it is a complex thing to do. Well, I, I'm kind of glad that you, you, you picked up on that, um, Dr Brown, because that, that's kind of where I was going with it. When I, when I uh, read the submissions and, the, and you know, I've heard um, about the group of teachers that met, uh, the convener and, and Mr Greer, I also took the opportunity uh, last night to contact um, by text, just a quick text, teachers I know, because I think like everybody we all know, many teachers are friends and, and that. And, and the kind of responses I've got back were maybe not as critical, I, I would say, um, but they, they were kind, kind of down the same line. And I think the impression I get is that teachers feel that the SQA is something that's done to them. I, and I'm, I, you know, I might be wrong, but it's, it's something that they've not really got a real say in or they're not really part of the process. And I, I actually am encouraged by what you said there and what I heard last week. I think that if you're able to drive that forward, as you've said, and it's more individualised, I think you can really change that perception. Um, and, and therefore, I'm, I'm quite happy uh, that, that that's the answer you've given. And do you think that you know local authorities and teachers in general can be more can be a bigger part of the, the governance uh, and, a, and accountability so that they're actually feeling more part of the process, you know? Well, I, we, we currently have um, 
people who are teachers on our board and we have um, representatives of teachers and teachers unions on our advisory council and that's one of the things that we very much take a focus on is we, we when we're doing when we're making changes for instance we will take those changes to the advisory council and get their feedback on them and and again part of the reason why we meet on a regular basis individually with the unions is to get their feedback on what we're trying to do um, I think I think the local authorities in terms of the Association of Rights of Education of Scotland, uh, SQA meets them and, and, and engages with them. Again, gets strong feedback on what is working and what is not working, and what and the different approaches that have been taken across the country in the different local authorities as to how they utilise the people that SQA has trained, because SQA has trained a significant number of people over and above our requirement in terms of standards and in terms of uh, internal assessment. And the expectation was that would, those people would be used by the local authorities. And I think, I think we need to look at how we can improve that across the piece. And that's closer engagement with, with the directors of education to understand what they need specifically from us. And the needs uh, may differ from the different regions of the country. For instance, Shetland find it uh, challenging to be able to send teachers to the events that we run. So we've started to do webinars, we've started to uh, do um, twilight sessions so that people who cannot travel and who can't, or who can't get out of school for other reasons are able to engage with us, give us their feedback, but also learn and, and um, be able to respond when we need to respond to them in, in different ways as opposed to just assuming everyone can come to uh, an event even if it's in Aberdeen. Okay. Just remind the witnesses that we, we've got an awful lot to go through today, so if we could have shorter responses. Tavis Scott. Thank you. Just, uh, oh, uh, if I may, Dr. Brand, drag you back to the performance of the SQA. In one of the submissions today from a physics teacher with regard to higher higher physics assignment, uh, they say, and please correct uh, correct uh, correct the record if this is wrong. They say that several of these documents are already on their third version, despite it being the third occasion the course has run. The submission goes on to say a total of 81 pages of guidance across five different documents, three accessible on the main SQA website, but two on the SQA secure website. Is that all true? Um, I cannot um, tell you whether the exact numbers are true. There is a significant amount of documentation associated with this, and that is what I was trying to say. If you write a document... Is it, is it true that it is a third version uh, on the, uh, of the documents on the third occasion this course has been run? There, that is, I, I don't know the answer specifically to that, but what I would say is that is not... Uh, unlikely because yeah. one of the things we've been doing is trying to respond to the feedback the teachers have been giving us. In responding to that feedback, we have to modify our documentation. And that that is a sort of double-edged sword for a teacher because one of the things that they wish is that we change the way that we're approaching something. Sure, but, but you, were, you made some good points about the format and, and the points yes. about simplification. Is it simplified to have uh, five different documents, three accessible on one website and two available on another website? Is that accessible to teachers? Well, one of, one of the things we try and do is we try and make information accessible to not just teachers. And, and part of that challenge, again, in terms of the, of the way in which it's worded, is, is, is a significant issue. But we try and make that available to uh, other interested staff stakeholders who wish to see that. That is the general... But my son's doing physics. I want his physics teacher to know what the stuff is. Absolutely. So the primary responsibility you have is to get this information easily to teachers, isn't it? Yes, it is. So is three websites... Uh, sorry, five... Yeah, two, three different websites and 81 pages across five different documents are the easiest way to do that? No, absolutely no. So not. So what are you doing about fixing well, what it What we're doing about that is we're actually... Um, Again, we're, we're improving our systems. <laughs> well, can I, can I just say it is a real challenge for a public sector body to, to renew its systems? You mean IT systems? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Right. Um, <sighs> Please don't scare me anymore. No, we're not, we're not, we're not doing it in, in, in a very large, big bang way. What we're, what we're looking at is... We've heard that before. <laughs> I'm quite happy to go through our approach to this, if you would like me to. No, I, I'm not too bothered about the systems. Okay. Please but, write, but maybe me, you can write to the committee yes, on the systems, yes, okay. because some of us have been in the audit but, committee and seen these from different organisations in the public yes. sector and have seen scare story after Absolutely. scare story. So maybe you could write to us on that. Yes. Could you go on and just but describe... Can, can, can I just answer your point about, the, about the, the, the different websites being accessed? Sure. One of the things we are currently in the process of doing is, is giving individual teachers individual access. Now, as I said, that's not going to happen tomorrow, but... The, 
the, the approach that we have is that a teacher will have associated with them what they can see. They will go through one website and that one website will give them access to the secure information they need to see and the generic information. If I, as a parent, wishes to go onto our SQA website, they will not be allowed to go into the secure website, but it will be transparent to that teacher as to where that documentation is held. Of when will that be available? That is the process that we're currently undertaking, and we, that will not be in the next session, uh, because it is not an easy thing to do. So, so forgive me, when will it be available? Uh, right now, I don't know when we'll be able to deliver that, but we are planning, and we have a detailed planning process in place to understand when we can deliver that. Um, given the complexity of the other activities that we're undertaking. Okay, and the other question I wanted to supplement, I wanted to ask further to the convenience questions, was um, you'll be familiar because you've obviously seen all these submissions um, that the committee has had. The, the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers claimed that this year's higher exam was, quote, the worst uh, ever. Why is that? Um, on, on, uh, we, we have had, um, we continue to have regular dialogue with the Royal Society of Geographers. In fact, they were in to see us last week and we have another meeting set up in January. Um, on, uh, we have not received significant feedback other than what we have just seen in, your, um, in the submissions to the committee as to the, the nature of the exam paper during the, um, during the session. Uh, on the day, there was very little feedback. We got very little feedback afterwards. We have had conversations as to the nature of the content, and I think uh, if you were to look at our subject review reports on geography, you will see that part of the actions was to address some of the findings that we had um, found uh, associated with our fieldwork and also the conversation and input that we've had from people like the Royal Society of Geographers. So some of the changes that they're looking to, to see are already documented in that May uh, um, document that went out. But we were, the committee's been told that, uh, that more than half of the respondents to the survey said that the paper was, quote, poor, shocking, terrible, worst ever, and nothing like the specimen or previous papers. Putting aside all the adjectives, uh, nothing like the specimen or previous paper. Is that true? No. That's it, not true. That is not true. You'd be able to furnish the committee with the evidence to the contrary. Yes, we, of that. Will. we will. Okay, well, maybe could you furnish the committee with a real detailed answer to yes. why so many geography teachers think it's the worst ever? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel? Thank you. So, I mean, we've been on to your finance, a significant 75% of the SQA's cost base comes from uh, its payroll. Um, and a significant part of that is from uh, appointees, i.e., markers and invigilators. So, it's concerning the reports in The Guardian that the SQA, at a recent meeting with the Poverty Alliance, couldn't confirm the actual hourly rate paid to invigilators. And clearly, that has an impact on your ability to comply both with the living wage. Uh, and also national living wage, minimum wage legislation. So given that invigilators aren't paid hourly, can I confirm that the SQA has no way currently of knowing the effective hourly rate that each invigilator is paid? Or in other words, you don't know if you're paying the living wage or not to your invigilators, do you? Um, yeah, um, well, thank you for your question on that, because that's something that we've been working on with um, um, internally and with the Poverty Alliance recently. Um, we have a process in place which takes account of the way invigilators and chief invigilators wish to work, um, particularly chief invigilators and how they manage um, invigilator, invigilators over the session, uh, over the exam uh, diet period. And we, the, we pay a session fee of £27.15 per session, which is either a half day or, or, or which, which can be as much, four hours or more. No, no, sorry, it is, it's not. Um, at least about 47% of those um, of our diets uh, is under two and a half hours. Um, That's, we have but you're not analysis. including extra time there, are you, or preparation time? There's half an hour for preparation time. Is, in, is on top of that. I, I accept that. So it should take it to over three and a half hours. No, it, no, it's it's not to be. It, Your own guidance says half an hour either side. No, it's 15 minutes either side. Sorry, it, up to 45 minutes is what I've seen written down. However, the the, the the bottom line is that we have looked at, at the the diet, the number of exam sessions. The majority of them, uh, sorry, not the majority, at least half of them are under two and a half hours, and where, where those happen. Obviously, what we are paying is, is significantly more than the minimum wage and the living wage. There are other days when, or other sessions, which might, yes, be, be longer, but 
What the Chief Invigilators are um, responsible for doing is making sure that there's a fair allocation of sessions across the pay period, across the, the payment period for the, the, the diet to ensure that um, we are satisfying the living wage. What we've accepted though and what we recognise is that because we pay by session and because the Chief Invigilators have the right to, to or in, have, are able to look at the workload an invigilator has taken on in a particular uh, centre. If they think that invigilator has worked more hours, they have the right to add another session fee for that invigilator. Equally, chief invigilators or invigilators can speak to us if they think they've done more, uh, more time than we have allocated. So that's the process as it has been. The process going forward is that we will, is that we will now record the hourly rate so we have added now for the, the, the forms that we use to collect the information on the payment for invigilators so that we will now have the hours worked so that we can absolutely be sure and, have, and demonstrate the evidence that, um, that, that we are paying the living so, wage. So in effect, you're saying to me that you don't know the effective hourly rate that invigilators are being paid. That's the long and the short of what you've just said. What, what, what we have done is, is uh, at the moment, it is uh, we are asking the chief invigilator to highlight to us when okay. that has not been the case. What we're doing is formalising that mechanism. So, so, I mean, based on the, the information you provided, £27.15 £27 for a session, that can last as many as four hours. When it's four hours for that session, the effective hourly rate is below seven pounds. When the national living, sorry, when the living wage rate is eight pounds forty-five, yeah. that's correct, isn't it? If, if it, it may be in that one session, indeed. But and what, what you look at when you're calculating the minimum wage or the living wage, you look over the payment period and how much work has been done. But over you don't that actually period. know if that's happening or not, do you? Yes. We, we, well, the chief invigilators are, we pay the chief invigilators to manage the invigilators so, and to, to, to keep those records. And therefore, they, um, they have the, the right and the ability to add an additional session fee if they think that that has not happened. So, so I have um, uh, statements from chief invigilators who are saying that the only way they can ensure not only that, that their invigilators are paid above the living wage, but in fact above the national living wage, is by adding them on to sessions where they know there are surplus to requirements and they'll be sent home. I mean, surely that is a wholly inadequate way to be paying people. Indeed, these are the sort of practices, surely, that when we see them in the private sector, i.e. extensions to, to people's um, working day through additional requirements and duties, which we condemn as poverty pay practices, surely that is something that we should condemn the private sector, but it's something that just frankly shouldn't be taking place in the public sector whatsoever. Um can I, can I just say, I think if you if you look at over the pay period, some of those uh, invigilators will be working less than the, set, the full session time, but will be paid for the full session time. Yeah. And that is the point of, of paying them over the entire pay period. It's as if you're working uh, a working week and you get paid at the end of that week. And on some days you work three hours and on other days you work eight hours. The, the pay period is over the week. That is the conversation we've been having with the Poverty Alliance. That, is, is the, the, the diet period? The di we, pay in, we pay monthly, but the diet period is six weeks, so, but we, right. so there's essentially a payment at the end of uh, probably June and then July, um, based on the, the fact the exams are April and May. So, yeah. Sorry, it may be May and June, rather. Yeah. Okay. Can, can I ask why you're not just paying an hourly rate? Surely that would be the straightforward, transparent way to it, and what good employment practice would dictate. Indeed, it's what happens in other exam boards in the UK. On the... Um, in 2014, we actually reviewed um, the whole approach to invigilation payment and talked to chief invigilators about that. And there was two reasons why we continued with the session fee. One was that chief invigilators felt it worked better for them in terms of how they managed the process. But equally, if we, if we only paid the hourly rate, many of our invigilators would be paid significantly less than, than the session you don't. fee. And that You've would... already admitted you don't know what the effect of hourly rate is. The, uh, but we do know, uh, we do the, know, session we do know the session times, and we know that 3% of our session times in 2015 were 3, three or 3.5 three hours. Before additional admin, so the four hours that you're talking about is about 3% of the diet. The rest of the time, um, people are being paid either £9.05 an hour or significantly more than £9.05 an hour. But you accept if... Invigilators are working four hours, or indeed more, once you take in both prep time and extra time, that the effective hourly rate for that session would be well below £7. 
and that is significantly less than £8.45. Do you a, accept that? In very, in very limited circumstances not, where... It, it is, actually, just because it's, the, it's those parts... It's you those only parts have to look at the exam timetable see that there's a very significant number of exams which would take you uh, past that four-hour period in the exam diet. So, but we've, well, we have done that analysis, which I can share with you, um, of the 2015 diet. And, as I say, 3% are in the three hours to three and a half hour. Um, band, which with the ad, when you add the half hour for administration, yes, would take you over four, the four hours. Um, where you do have um, special circumstances, there's a bit, uh, there's extra time, but that is a small part of the diet. Each, each exam, a lot of the exams are half an hour, some of them are an hour and a half, some of them are two hours, some are two and a half. When you add in the admin element, which is 30 minutes, then most people, the vast majority, are being paid £9.5 an hour or more. And over the pay, full you, pay period, they are all paid the living wage? Yes. But, you, but, but uh, with, with respect, you don't know that, and you have no way of knowing well, that. You, well, you've admitted to the problem that you have no mechanism for measuring or tracking that. So I actually I struggle to understand how you can say that with such confidence. I, I, I say that because one of the things we... we uh, one of the responsibilities of our chief invigilators is to ask us, is to highlight to us when we need extra, when they need to pay extra for, for, um, for people going over their time. What you have highlighted is the fact that we don't have that reporting mechanism, and that is what we're putting in place. So I do agree with you, there is a reporting yeah. structure yes. that needs to be put in place to, to address that. And you'll send us the, yes. the information yes. you've got to yes. show that that's been happening. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Richard, you next. Thank you. I, I just want to uh, briefly return to the previous theme of <coughs> complexity and some of the issues we heard back from the teachers. You know, no one wants to undermine the SQA or call into question uh, your credibility in terms of the impact you could have on Scottish education. But some of the feedback we have had does cause concern uh, from teachers in terms of the unclear marking instructions, unclear complex course documentation. And I know some previous questions have uh, alluded to these concerns expressed by teachers. How does it get to that stage? I just want to know how we get to the stage where teachers find what has been issued by the SQA very complex, vague and difficult to understand? Um, I think in, in introducing any new qualification that has a significant um, change associated with it, you, we, are, we are required to provide information. One of the challenges that we've had, and I think has been discussed at previous committees, both just for myself but with others around the table, um, is the fact that teachers rightly requested more and more information. As you put more and more information out into the system, it becomes more and more complex, especially when you're putting it out there in individual documents rather than, um, uh, as we've described, the, the good way that technology would allow us to be able to do that in the future. So I think the, 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 the whole issue that's been raised earlier around um, which version are we talking about is a real challenge. Uh, we have tried to respond to the way in which teachers have, have told us that they, they would prefer things to be seen differently. We've done that, um, and in some cases that has increased the level of complexity because that's another document that's out there. Uh, one of the things that we committed to do was to review our documentation and to streamline it. As we move into the revised qualifications, uh, revised assessment for the national qualifications that we're currently at the start of, um, that documentation will be completely revised and will be much simpler. And, and I think um, it is an opportunity for us to address that issue. Okay. It's got there because of, of, of the, the, the timing at which the qualifications were introduced. Um, the qualifications were introduced during the same session as they were being uh, implemented, and that produced an additional challenge. OK. Two, two more brief questions. Firstly, do you think we're in danger of sinking in a sea of jargon? And is there anything the SQA can do about that? In your opening remarks, you said the phrase associated personalisation models, whichever that means. But, you know, and I know that the leaders of SQA will be wrapped up in their day-to-day -day jobs yeah. of dealing with education and, you know, all the professional uh, aspects of your job. But how on earth do we demystify Scottish education and then perhaps address the issue that communication could actually be improved? Um, I, I, I think there is a danger that we all sink in jargon. 
Uh, and in fact, one of the things that happened when the committee visited SQA is I kept reminding people to not to, to spell things out because it, you do, you, at, at, by the nature of any business or in any organisation, you, you use your own shorthand. Um, I, think, I think that is a very, very key point. And I think the point that was made about how do we communicate with parents in a different way is another key point. It, it is about demystifying it. I think it is about um, going back and looking at the original full set of documentation associated with CFE not just about the qualifications and looking at what does that say and making sure that we say it in a clear and concise way. The whole issue of personalization and choice, just to explain that, that is about um, allowing teachers to be able to teach a particular topic like anger momentum in a way that is of, in a, in a, uh, a context that's of interest to that particular class that's sitting in front of them as opposed to uh, a particular context that SQA defines. And that, that is, that's a long-winded way of saying personalisation. But personalisation, if it's not understood, is not valuable. Okay. Final question is a big theme. One of the big themes just now in education is teacher workload. So how do you measure teacher workload and the impact of what the SQA issues has on teacher workload? And do you feel that since you've been in post that the teacher workload has increased or decreased in Scotland? Part of, the, um, part of the reasoning for us to go out and do field work was to try and understand the nature and the causes behind what we were hearing from not just teacher unions but for teachers across the country of the workload that they were experiencing. And that is what we did. We did that specifically to understand what part SQA's role played in that workload. As part of that research, we also identified other things that were playing a part in that workload that manifested itself in assessments. Um, and it is our responsibility to not only address the component that we are responsible for, but to continuously raise the issues uh, that need to be addressed to reduce the workload associated with assessment as a result of other aspects from across the system. So I, I do take that role um, very seriously. It's not just for us to just sit and say we've done our bit. It's actually our responsibility to keep that on the forefront. I think um, that the, the nature of the way in which curriculum for excellence, qualifications, the idea that teachers could develop their own assessments um, to allow them to teach in a, a particular subject in a, in a particular context, that workload was significant. So yes, that is our contribu contribution to that. I think that is, that's a balance against what are we trying to achieve with the Curriculum for Excellence. So um, I suppose for me, if you, if you were to say the way that the, um, the old qualifications were developed, where there were off-the-shelf assessments and there were off-the-shelf books and there were off-the-shelf everything else, was probably less of a workload for teachers. The challenge for Scotland, I think, is to understand whether that's the type of education we want or we want the ability to teach in uh, not to that straitjacket because there is a negative to that straitjacket of, of providing the, the detailed assessments and the detailed information. OK, thank you, Richard. John? Um, thank you very much. Maybe I should declare an interest as an ex-school teacher. I don't know if it ever leaves you, but I was a school teacher for 20 years when standard grades were introduced. So I know that when there's change, with some people within the profession might be a bit reluctant. They might be a bit concerned. They might be a bit anxious. I have to say to you, having read the evidence that was given to us by um, a whole range of organisations, individual teachers, it is of a different level. Do you recognise that it's of a different level to simply saying, we well, you know what t teachers are like, they don't like change, they'd rather have a book off a shelf rather than do their job, which frankly is the defence that you're presenting today? Uh, I didn't mean to make that, um, I did not mean to, 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 to say that, that's not, that's not what I meant. What, what, what I was, what I, teachers have a very difficult job. Um, teachers are there and they feel passionately about educating the, the, the young people in front of them. What, I'm, what I was trying to indicate was that by the nature of what Curriculum for Excellence was trying to do, there, there, was, there was a decision taken that there would not be uh, detailed off-the-shelf assessments provided to teachers. Um, it was very much around trying to um, 
um, move towards uh, a use of evidence that was naturally occurring within the classroom. Now, that is something that has not worked for multiple reasons. And, and that is the reason why we need to address it and the need to address that issue. I think as a result of that approach, it's been more complicated and more challenging but if your for teachers. If your mindset is that the problem is school teachers don't want to change, you mm. end up in a position where you come to this committee, having read presumably the same papers that I read, and still say that you have a strong working relationship with teachers. In what parallel universe do you have a strong working relationship with school teachers? Uh, I, I am not saying that teachers do not want to change. What I'm saying is that the nature of the information and the nature of the, st of the structured um, provision by SQA was different as a result of the philosophy of CFE. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not the case. I mean, I don't know if you've looked in any details what the themes are that are coming out yes. from the evidence which is not really about curriculum for excellence, it's about not being able to access information, getting different answers to the same question at different times, constant change. I mean, I would have thought if your core business was presenting a document, you shouldn't just be waiting for feedback and getting, then having seven different iterations of it. Perhaps there should be something pretty solid at the very beginning. Uh, Unless you simply throw something out and then see what feedback comes back. I mean, I'm genuinely astonished at the... The fact there's so many criticisms here, and what we're getting back is it seems to be about process. Well, in future, we can use the technology, and technology has existed for quite a long time. Can you explain as a, an example of it? What motivates geography teachers not to tell you there's a problem with the paper, but for the Society of Geography Teachers to present a document which is scathing about the geography paper? Um, I, I'd like to refer back to what I said earlier about the subject review reports. One of the things we have done is actively engaged with each particular subject area. We have something called a national qualification support team, which is made up of teachers and of teacher unions and of uh, others, other stakeholders involved in that particular subject. Every single one of those was uh, engaged in uh, trying to understand what was working was not working on a subject-by-subject -subject level. As a result of that conversation in geography, there was a set of actions that were identified that was published in the subject review reports. We do actively engage with teachers and we continue to engage with the Royal Society of Geographers and we will continue to move forward on making sure that we address the issues. But as I've said er earlier, um, in some subjects, you will find two different teachers saying there should be two different sorts of content in a particular course, and it is SQA's job so to try fault, and mediate then. between. No, it is. It's the same. It's the same as you would. You would. Um, you would talk to two different academics in a university. They will have a different view of, of the nature of what's important in their subject. So whose job is it to make that decision? This sounds, it, again... It, it, is, it, it is. That's why we pull together a group of people from across the piece to try and get a consensus view of what should be in that particular qualification. And you singularly fail to get that consensus. We have a consensus, but on a consensus, you always have people who are not happy with that consensus. So all of the people who have written to the committee to express their concerns are people who, for whatever reason, are not prepared to fall in with the consensus that exists. The consensus I think exists is that people don't think SQA is working properly, that it's in the road of them doing their job, not the people who are dragging their heels and don't want change. People who clearly are trying to navigate themselves around a system in the best interests of the mm -hmm. subject they care about and the young people they're teaching, and they regard the SQA as a block to that. What is your answer to that? It can't simply be that over here we've built a consensus and these people are just going to, well, they don't no. get it. No, I, I, absolutely not. And, and what, I've, what I've been trying to say is that what we do is when we get feedback, such as the feedback that you have got, we look at it and we make changes. Unfortunately, when we make the, those changes, we end up changing our documentation. And that has a knock-on impact on people's confusions and, 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 and on the... On the People's uh, concerns are not just about the documentation. The, no, I, if it were just simply that you put the wrong word in a document and there was a debate about what that word meant, fair enough, that can get sorted. There's three hours worth of reading of doc mm -hmm. documents I took time to read last night, as I'm sure my colleagues did. And it's not people nitpicking. It's people saying there's a fundamental problem 
And what I get today is you don't accept there's a fundamental problem. When you were asked about the geography teachers, you said you didn't know they had a problem with the paper. You uh, hadn't been aware, we, despite we, the fact they produce a survey, which I have never read anything like it in all my, in, in all my life. We, we have had a follow-on conversation with the, with the geographers and we fully understand the position. And, and, and at, the at the point of, of delivery of that examination, we did not get feedback. That is what I was trying to, to indicate. We did not get feedback that there was an issue. We, that, that paper was to standard. And that paper was aligned with the uh, previous question papers that had been put out there. So the geography teachers are wrong then? What we're saying is... All of them. 75% of them who said it wasn't adequate, not a group on a committee, but 75% of those surveyed of those who care surveyed. deeply about their subject are saying there's a problem. Do and you accept there's a problem or not? I have said, as part of our research and our taking of information, we have published a subject review report on geography which indicates the changes we are making as a result of that feedback, some of which has come from the Royal Society of Geographers. Okay. Thanks, John. All right, we'll move on to uh, oh, Ross Greer, sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Um, it's they've been mentioned a number of times already, so the first question should be relatively short. There are clearly problems in the way that assessments are put together. We saw it last year with uh, the higher maths paper, this year with the National 5 computing. I'm, I'm confused. A lot of the discussion so far has, has revolved around uh, quality control measures, uh, around resource allocation. You mentioned extra resource, resources being allocated to STEM subjects, and yet this year the most high-profile issue was with the National 5 paper. Is it the case that the it doesn't matter how much extra resource you're putting into it, your quality control structures are simply not working and there needs to be a more fundamental re-evaluation of them. I think if you, if you um, well, first and foremost, we re-evaluate re everything we do every year after we finish a diet. We go through and we look at what's worked, what hasn't worked, and we try and identify ways in which we improve. That is what happens every single year after the diet has co completed. That includes the question papers. It includes the procedures and the processes that we undertake to deliver that um, 140,000 set uh, candidate um, certification. Um, one of the things that we, um, particularly with the National 5 computing, is one of the aspects associated with that was the computing language that was involved with Haggis. And that we have had subsequent conversations with the developer of that particular uh, language and we've, we've reached a, a process improvement associated with that that makes sure that that issue will not occur again. Uh, each individual problem is addressed at that particular point in time. Addressing each individual problem, though, as you point out, is not sufficient. We do need to make sure that we look at our quality control procedures across the piece. One of the reasons we've introduced e-marking is to improve the quality assurance of the marking procedures that we undertake. So we are actively looking at how we continue to improve the quality. And as I've said before, uh, Scottish qualifications, the SQA qualifications, are seen uh, as high quality qualifications that are regarded highly by not only those candidates taking them, but also the receiving organisations that take the candidates. When the issues with the National 5 uh, computing paper came up, the SQA engaged in what I would describe as defensive PR and indeed said that the anecdotal evidence that you'd received from teachers, the initial anecdotal evidence was positive. I cannot understand how that was the case. The anecdotal evidence that I was receiving at that point was teachers contacting myself and I'm sure uh, colleagues as well because they were so concerned by the paper, so concerned that the SQA wasn't taking their concerns seriously that we were being asked to raise it in the chamber, which uh, I did, I believe Liz Smith did as well. Why does the SQA believe that at a time where there's clearly issues of teacher trust in yourselves, that a defensive PR exercise that publicly dismisses these concerns is helpful? I think uh, if, you, if you remember back to that time, one of the things I specifically said is that we had made errors in that paper and that we needed to address the, that. The initial response I've got, uh, the response is here. Uh, an initial statement from the SQA said that uh, the paper met our course and assessment specifications, allowed candidates to demonstrate knowledge and understanding. Anecdotal feedback was positive. You later altered that line and released a statement saying that the exam paper contained a small number of typographical errors. The initial statement was not that. The initial statement was very defensive. 
I, I, I take that point. I do, however, um, remember, because I sat through that particular grey boundary, that the way in which that paper was set allowed candidates to be able to demonstrate what they, they could do. And we subsequently have had meetings with the Computer Society of Scotland, and we've discussed this, and we've discussed whether there were any issues associated with the candidates not being able to, to um, do the question paper, and the issues associated with that was felt by all of us that candidates were able to demonstrate what they needed to do. So the, it, whilst the errors were there, we were, we were absolutely able to certificate appropriately with that examination. Taking aside the, the issues with the paper itself, <sighs> what I fail to understand is why you were publicly dismissive of concerns initially. The, I mean, you, the SQA in your submission to the uh, committee cite a, a survey that you conducted, the results of which are entirely contradictory to the survey results that this committee received, to the overwhelming weight of the evidence in the submissions that we received. I can't understand this. There's, there are clearly issues of teacher trust in the SQA. Your public statements initially when these uh, issues come up are dismissive. And the survey response that you've submitted as part of your evidence, I just don't understand where it comes from. The survey, was, the survey that we undertake is an independent survey. It is not an SQA survey. It is an independent survey that, independently, that, that randomly samples our customer base. And we do that on a biannual basis. Why do you think it is so radically contradictory to all the other evidence that we've received, all the other evidence? Um, I, I, I think um, one of the things that we, we do, because it's a random sample, um, you get a random set of views. Rightly, people who have concerns see the committee as a way to address their concerns, and I think that's a very important role that the committee has. And uh, all I can say is that we're, we will be going out again. Um, we, we go out, we are going out for our field work and we'll get the feedback from them, but we will also be going out again with an independent survey of our customers to get feedback on so that. So is this random survey unrepresentative or is our evidence unrepresentative? I don't know the answer to that. I do know that there are teachers that have concerns about what we do, and I do know that we continue to try and engage with as many of those as possible. Uh, and try and address their issues and try and change what we do to make sure that we continue to address those issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to uh, resource pressures. And Ross Thompson, thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, convener. And also, I would like to extend my thanks to you for welcoming us to your HQ in Glasgow and found the visit there um, really helpful. So, again, thanks for your time. Um, last week. Uh, during that particular visit, uh, one of the key themes that came through uh, for me around about uh, resources was um, how SQA is going through uh, that intense period again of uh, assessment redesign. Now that being on top of what is business as usual uh, and the commercial side of that as well, which is on top of um, your programme of transformation, um, touching on the, the IT issues, and I know that is part of that. And it's been so clear during this uh, committee, and you've acknowledged it yourself, um, that in relation to getting this uh, design, uh, re getting the new assessments in place for DIE 18, it's absolutely crucial that it's right and that there are no mistakes. Now, I'm aware that you are, don't have the same resources you did with the curriculum for excellence because you had that development team, and this has all now been done in-house. So the question is, in relation to pre-budget scrutiny side of things, what resources do you need? Where should they be coming from? And do you have enough to make sure that we do get this right going into the diet 18? Okay, um, the decision was made to redesign the assessments in September. One of the things that SQA has to do because of the complexity of the job that we do is we have to have a detailed plan to understand exactly what do we have to do when to make the deadline. Uh, we're currently in the process of doing that planning. That planning includes understanding what we're going to do uh, how we're going to identify what we're going to do, what resources we're going to require, and how long we're going to have to have those resources for when we need them. Uh, we're currently in the midst of that planning process, and we anticipate that planning process to have finished by the end of November, beginning of December. Um, we are expecting and fully anticipate that we will require additional resources, uh, because if we remember the people who help uh, develop and deliver the qualifications are the teachers of Scotland. Uh, so we will be asking teachers to engage with us on that. That is going to be a challenge. We, we, as I said earlier, we engage with the directors of education, with, with the head teachers association and with the unions on the fact that 
in order to develop qualifications in Scotland, you have to have the participation of teachers, and that's why we get so many of them working with us. Um, that the identification of the nature of the resources is currently being scoped. Um, we are um, looking at making sure that we minimise that as much as possible. But you're absolutely right, we have to get it right because it is not appropriate to have any errors. It is a hugely challenging timetable because um, we all know that the session doesn't start in, eight, in August as many people think it does. It actually starts straight after the exam cycle, so it starts in May. However, the nature and the content of the course is not changing, so teachers don't have to worry about the course changing. It's the method of assessment that is changing. And, um, and that is, that is a, a difference from where we were with Curriculum for Excellence. So I can't tell you exactly what we're going to need, but I can tell you that we will know exactly what we, ne we need. We will then be working very closely with our partners to identify where that is going to come from. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brown. Um, and I know it's been highlighted by, by other members, um, but when it does come to you know, mistakes which have been mentioned, uh, particularly the, the, sort of the typographical errors that we saw in the national computing exam, um, we know that these are mistakes which, which the SQA are responsible for. Um, in that particular instance, it ranged from grammatical mistakes to questions that simply couldn't be answered. So my question is, how much of these mistakes are related to the resource issues that you've identified? And also, are you confident that the executive management team has the skills and the leadership too? Um, the executive management team is a very um, well positioned and a very uh, strong level of expertise across the piece in order to deliver this. I think if you, if you look at what SQA was asked to deliver in terms of curriculum for excellence, in terms of uh, the qualifications, every single milestone, whilst they might, might not have been what the teachers had wanted, but they were the milestones that were agreed by the CFE management board, all of those were met. In terms of the, the uh, ability, the, the, the issue associated with errors, is that associated with uh, a resource issue? Um, one of the things we have done in terms of the, 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 the work that we've identified as a result of our lessons learned exercise is we have actually uh, increased the amount of resource that has gone into the STEM subjects in terms of that space because, again, that, was a very, that is a very um, exam-heavy and question paper-heavy area, so we've, we've increased the resources that we've put into that. Um, I am not going to hide behind the fact that it's a resource issue that, that, that resulted in that error, though, because I don't think it's appropriate to do so. Okay. Um, and, and following on from, from that in relation to resources, one of the, again, themes that sort of came out from the, the meeting, the presentation, was that um, an area of real cost pressure it seems to be that, I think it was portrayed a significantly higher level of support that you have to give to the system in relation to CPD and, and teacher training. Um, and it's something that we were advised during the visit was something which would previously been carried out maybe by local authorities. Um, and we know that local authorities are obviously going through their own uh, cost pressures um, and reducing budgets. Um, and I would like to get an idea from you in relation to where the public money is, is, is coming from. Would it be better that local authorities take on that role if this is a significant cost pressure for you? Um, or is it something which uh, the SQA should continue to do but would obviously necessitate quite a significant grant from Scottish Government? There are aspects of the support that we provide that, that need to be provided by SQA given the, ex the assessment expertise. There are other areas that may well be better delivered elsewhere. And I think that's, that's something that, that we need to discuss and that is, that is uh, an area for discussion that is occurring at the um, Assessment and National Qualifications Group is to try and understand where is the best place. One of, one of, the, one of the reasons why we trained more um, nominees than we needed in terms of understanding standards was because we wanted to make sure that that resource was available in the local authorities. Um, we are not precious about retaining um, uh, that level of support that we have put in place, rightly actually, because teachers teachers have a right to expect a lot of support during the early implementation of new qualifications. But where, where that is totally appropriate for SQA to do that, we believe we should continue to 
where it is something that we're doing in terms of subject-specific support, for instance, whereby we will offer every local authority, if they wish us to come in and specifically talk about a particular subject, we will go in and run sessions for their, for their schools. We ask, through our liaison officers, who visit every school across Scotland, if there are, are particular issues in any school, we will go into that school and work with them on that. That is not necessarily best done by SQA. It's, it's, it's a question that I think um, we need to think about as a system. Um, I just have a, a supplementary following on from the, the questioning um, of the convener. Um, as you know, we've obviously conducted an online uh, survey uh, as part of the committee, and 71% and of all of those respondents were teachers. 67% um, of all of the respondents expressed distrust um, in the SQA um, by strongly disagreeing with the statement, which is that our customers and users trust us to get it right for them. So I have to ask Dr Brown, why don't your customers trust you? Um, I think I, 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 the feedback that we get varies significantly. We have customers that, that are frustrated by how we uh, engage with them, but we have other customers who are very happy. I think you'll also have seen a submission from one of the colleges indicating the level of support we undertook, and another submission which actually um, cited SQA as, a, as one of the best awarding bodies in the UK. So I think there, there is a variety of views, and, and I think uh, it is important that we don't only focus on the good news, we focus on the issues that are identified, um, and that's one of the things that we, we try and do. Okay, um, and I've just got a, a, a last uh, question on uh, the quality uh, assurance side, um, which is uh, in relation to, to, to markers. I know, uh, you know questions have all been raised in relation to geography and computing science. Um, in my own area, I've had a, a constituent who's contacted me um, whose son was predicted to get five A's. They ended up getting four A's and failed geography, uh, despite achieving 92% in their geography prelim. Um, the appeal was rejected, and I know that his parents in particular are worried that some of that work may have been lost in transit to the marker. Um, I'm looking for reassurances from you in terms of what you do to ensure um, that you do have the quality of markers um, that's needed, um, especially given some of the submissions that we've seen already to this committee where markers feel um, that there isn't enough information, where they feel um, that it is, the information that is there that is uh, confusing. Um, and in fact, in relation to art and design, um, there was some real criticism there uh, that the SQA had not communicated well enough to teachers or pupils about what was needed or required. One of the things that we do every year is we run markers meetings to specifically uh, have the opportunity to meet markers face to face to make sure that uh, if they have concerns or if there is confusion or, or if they, are, are, uh, they have questions about the nature of the marking that they are able to do that. In terms of e-marking, uh, one of the other things that happens is um, we, we have team leaders for the e-marking uh, group. And if we see a marker is having difficulty in terms of marking, that team leader will contact specifically that marker and have a conversation about what is it that you're finding difficult? Are you, are you, are you, uh, do you need clarification on any of those things? Uh, when we originally set out with CFE and e-marking, it was anticipated that at this point in time, um, we would not need to have as many face-to-face -face events. However, we've continued those face-to-face -face events because we believe that, that teachers get benefit from them and like them and the feedback that we get from those markers meetings is hugely positive and so that's why we're continuing to run them because it is it, because teachers run the system and it is very very important that we do make sure that that we have clarity in that okay thanks very much Colin Beattie and then Julian Martin. thank you very much. Uh, turning to the budget um, looking at the variable factors that come into this budget is this a sustainable financial model? Um, that's something that um, we discuss regularly, actually, with our board and with our external auditors. And the view, the, the view is um, that that we, yes, we are sustainable in terms of the going concern principle, if you like, from the accounting um, perspective. But it is quite difficult to predict um, accurately what our costs will be, our budgets need to be, um, because we haven't had the stability that I thought we would have coming into this particular year. 1617, I had hoped, would be the start of the start of the end, if you like, of the of the 
implementation of CFE, which has been the biggest change in the education sector for, for a generation. So I had expected that 1617 would be the first year where we would start to bed down and have business as usual. The announcement around the revision of national qualifications has meant that it's harder again to predict what our costs will be, and we're working through that just now. But you know that that will you know will determine what our budget will need to be by December and have those discussions with the Scottish Government. However, in terms of sustainability, where we were we are trying to get to is to reduce the, the pressure on the public purse. We want to be able to minimise the amount of grant that we, that we need to, to deliver the business. But we're trying to balance that with ensuring the safe delivery of the diet each year while we're making further changes. So it is quite, it is quite difficult to get to a sustainable I, position. And, and I think the, the other component that was in our submission is, is the fact that we are aware that um, the, the fees that we charge for um, the qualifications in Scotland do not cover the cost of delivery um, and therefore there is there is a, a funding gap mm -hmm. associated with that. The fees have been in place since 2010 uh, but we, there has been a fixed uh, rate charged based on 2013-14 candidate numbers, so 12-13 candidate numbers uh, to local authorities um, and we have not and, and as uh, we, we are getting more candidates than was anticipated sitting our qualifications. Therefore, our costs are going up, but our income is remaining the same. Yeah. Just, just looking at one or two of the component parts here, and you mentioned about this uh, question of the fixed charge arrangement for local authorities. Um, that presumably does not cover the cost at this time. No. So it's, in effect, subsidised. Yes. 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 So local authorities have some... Uh, certainty in, in their budgeting that this yes. is what they will be charged, but the uncertainty is then passed to you. So, if you yes. like, the cost is actually just being passed up the line. It's, yeah, yeah, yes, no... it's actually, um, yes, essentially the 2010 prices obviously didn't even cover costs at that point. Um, so, they've been held at 2010 prices. The 12 13 candidate entry levels um, were, were, were true for that year. But we have taken the risk, if you like, of those varying. And what's happened is there's been more of those. So it's not only the interest. actual uh, fixed. Is this a fixed fee per head or a fixed no, fee as a, a global? It was what the it was what the local authorities were charged for their 2012, 13 candidate entries. We've charged them exactly the same thing for the last three years. Full total. Full total. So the total per. So the candidates can vary. So what sort of percentage? Uh, Increase as there been in the candidates. If if we had charged um, on 2010 fees for by candidate this year, we would have had an additional 1.2 million income. I see that in your papers. What sort of percentage increase though in the numbers of candidates have there been? Well, mm. I think I, I think there was the the the, the approach uh, again that was that it's not a responsibility of SQA, but the approach of two year. Um, qualification structures um, was would would have resulted in candidates bypassing and candidates bypassing national five, so those were rolled into into our um, assumptions, and we are we are seeing a significant. Um, if you look at the candidate entries at this diet versus last diet, uh, I think there was a very slight decrease in the number of candidates, but not significant. Looking at one specific area. Uh, there's reference here on page five of your uh, of your document you submitted. You're saying about non-commercial products to support niche sectors in the economy. Can you give us a little more uh, information uh, yeah. about that? Yes, uh, um, as as the um, awarding body for Scotland, as an NDPB, we are we are asked and expected to to develop and maintain prod, uh, qualifications. That, that are not commercially viable because we charge on candidate entries. There are some people have, that have very low uptake. Can you but give us an perhaps example? Well, aqu aquaculture, for example, is quite a small um, niche se sector, niche, niche, niche part of the, the, the economy that we, we are supporting. There are other areas that Furniture we support. Furniture making. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's the... Stone masons. It, it's the, the, the business that we should be doing. We're not, we're not in any way it's saying we shouldn't be doing this. this. We are a national awarding body. It is our responsibility to provide qualifications for the industry sectors that exist in Scotland. 
some of those industry <coughs> sectors are quite small or require uh, only a small number of, of candidates per year to go through a particular qualification. So things like fish farming, things, things like furniture making, um, we have qualifications in kilt making, we have qualifications in stone wall building that, that are a part of the fabric of Scotland. What it costs us to develop and deliver that is absolutely not covered by the small number of candidates taking those subjects every year. So is it a significant cost yes. that you're yes. bearing there? Yes. How much? For, for us, it, it, it is significant. For us to break even on national qualifications um, and, and the cost which of national... Different, which is a different piece. A different piece, yeah. 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 But it's so, a, but we, we, can, we can we can we yeah. can we can I mean, give you an estimate of what that means. Yeah. 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 It varies on a on a, on a topic by topic, topic basis. So, you know, uh, we can tell you whether I mean, you know, Latin advanced higher Latin probably does not wash its face. Mm -hmm. Never. Um, uh, no, but English for, definitely I'm does. I'm not looking for particular subjects. I'm just looking to see what the cost to your budget is in yes. supporting these. Okay. Okay. Can we yeah. move on? Maybe? Getting up here. One last question. Yeah, 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 of course. Just looking at uh, again, looking at uh, how you do, how you prepare your budget. If I recall correctly, in this document, it says 31st March is when you know how many how many students you're going to have coming through. Would that be correct? Yes, or how, uh, that's the final number. That's the final number. Yeah, finalisation of the number. And of course, numbers. you've got to prepare your budget in advance of that. Yes. Yes. How do you do it? We, we do it based on, on estimates. We, we get initial indications of candidate entries in November, and we need that to, to ensure that we can start to plan. But actually, teachers or, or, or centres can continue to change and, and move candidates um, a, a, you know, as, as going forward for an exa a, a final assessment or, or not, right up until the 31st of March. So we don't know the final numbers until the 31st of March. What's your so error margin? We, sorry? What's your error margin? You must have some margin that you work to. Um, well, what we do is we predict it in November, and it's, it's tended to be reasonably close. But, but I don't have an error margin as such. We, we know how many we expect to come through, um, and then it's, we, we confirm that in, at the end of March with the Scottish Government. There's a, there's a, there's, uh, there is a fluctuation, but it's not it's hugely it's not significant. significant. It's not hugely yeah. significant. And, and, and the more years under our belt that we have yeah. of the new qualifications, the more clear yes. that will be. Yes, there are. Um, because there, there has been a changing pattern of, of presentation. Um, and, and that is starting to stabilise, although yeah. we, we're not sure what will happen next year with the new assessments being mm -hmm. introduced. So we're still not in a steady state. So we have an estimate. We can look back at what happened last year and get an estimate of what we think might happen in the March. And that is why when we, we, we talk to the Scottish Government about our budget requirements, we say this is the draft as at um, January when we submit with our corporate plan. We, we, we estimate what we think it will be, but we continue to refine that um, after the 31st of March when we see what the, um, what the actual cost so is. So your budget be. only becomes firm at, with the government after the 31st of March? Yeah, it, we, we, can, we continue to have discussions with the government throughout the year. We tell them what we believe we will need for the full year. However, we firm that up with them in the, in the course of the year and at the, the budget revision stages, the spring budget revision, autumn budget revision, they will allocate additional funding to us in relation to what, what, they, what we need. I would, I would say from what you're saying there that there's no prospect of uh, SQA becoming self-sustaining. Um, one of the things that we, we, have, we actively chose to do is um, we actively chose, given the focus that we absolutely have to have on curriculum for excellence, a lot of the, the work that we were doing in that space was definitely put on the back burner. The issue for us now is to uh, take advantage of where we have that opportunity to bring in surplus that reduces our dependence on the public purse. And it's the surplus, not the income, that we need to focus on. Thank you very much. We, we're going to move on. And, and can I remind both members and witnesses to speak through the chair? Thank you very much. Jolly. Sorry. Um, largely, quite a lot of that, what I was going to ask you has already been asked, but it leads me on to maybe uh, coming off the back of uh, Colin's questioning about your income. Um, what is your income from appeals from schools? The post-result services um, fee. Um, 
Linda, while Linda's looking for the number, can I just say I that... I told you it was specific. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely does not cover the costs of doing the post results service. Mm -hmm. So, um, talking about money from the public purse, if you've got a situation where there's maybe some inconsistency, which has been mentioned in some of the responses around the assessments and the marking, that inevitably leads on to more schools wanting to appeal decisions on behalf of their, those pupils. So, on the one hand, that is affecting the, the public purse quite significantly because it's affecting schools' budgets. So they've obviously got limitations on how much they can actually spend. And it's also, if you say there's actually a shortfall in the, you know, the, 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 the fees that you get from schools and doesn't cover your efforts, how do you see that that, that, could, be, that could be solved? I, th I think the, the issue with post-result services is post-result services are there to address any anything that is uh, that, that teachers feel is inappropriate, whether whether a candidate's not got the qualification that they wanted, it is not an appeals process. It is actually going back and looking at how that candidate has has undertaken and has done in their in their assessments. I think that the the point of um, how those fees are paid, I think, is, is as we've said before, is, is not a matter for SQA. It is a matter for local authorities and for schools themselves. Um, one of the things that, that we see as we increase our quality assurance processes is that the success rate is declining. We have yet to publish this year's figures. That will be in the, uh, in the coming month. Um, but one of, the, one of the things is that we need to make sure that we continue to improve our quality assurance processes so that candidates get the right, the, the right result the first time. This is not like the, appeal, the old appeal system. So the old appeal system would look at, for example, prelim marks. It doesn't anymore. Am, no. I, am I right? No. Why not? Because there was, there was a, a, a review undertaken, a uh, very extensive consultation undertaken, and there was a feeling across teachers as well as across many other stakeholders that the old appeal system was unfair. This is a much fairer system. It is, it is a system that operates in every... It, the, the old appeal system was the only one in the world. No one else did it that way. Uh, one of the challenges, I think, that, that, um, that we have in the post result services is we do have special circumstances, and I think that is a huge benefit and a huge positive of the change away from appeals. Because if a candidate is truly, truly disadvantaged at the time of their exam, if they suffered a bereavement or if, or if they're ill, we now, because of the nature of what we do, can look at the evidence from whatever part that school wishes to give us. And we are able to certificate that candidate on results day. In the old system, we were unable to do that. We could only look at their, 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 um, their prelim. And if that prelim was, a, was a, a, a poor prelim, we could do nothing for that candidate. Mm. We, we have focused the requirements of the exceptional circumstances on those candidates that truly, truly need that, that specific support for, for their personal circumstances. One, one other thing I'd like to ask about, and I know it's not, it's remarking really, isn't it, instead of appeals? No, of remarking it, is, of the... it, it is not remarking. So how, how, can you talk me through how it's done then? Basically, you get a, it, it, it is a debate that's had across the world as to whether or not the second marker is better than the first marker. Mm -hmm. This is about checking that the marks are correct. And, and that means that you have a, a qualified marker go back and look at making sure that that marker has done a good job. If that marker has done a good job, there is no change. And at that point, the candidate will be charged. If the, that marker has not done a good job and the candidate uh, result is changed, there is no charge. There is no charge for exceptional circumstances either. Right. So how do you ensure the quality of, of markers? So you're looking ahead at your, your plan for the amount of markers that you're going to need for next year. And there have been some uh, criticism about the, the quality and quantity of markers in order to get these results out um, to the, the standards that you'd expect. What, what uh, are you undertaking to ensure the quality of markers well, for the, next year? The aspect that I talked about earlier, and I won't go over again, is, is the way in which we, we, we train our markers and we have markers meetings. But the recruitment of our markers is critical. We ask our markers to uh, give us an, an understanding of what their experience base is. And we have a set of criteria that says you have to be uh, a practicing teacher or very recently retired, and that you have to be teaching at this level and have taught at this level for a period of time. So that is the criteria that we use. Um, that, so that's the initial recruitment. We do anticipate that we will need more markers in the coming session. 
uh, because we're now um, we're extending the amount of external course assessment, uh, whether it's coursework or whether it's um, uh, it, the exam itself, as a result of the removal of units. So we are anticipating an increased requirement. Uh, one of the one of the other aspects of quality assurance that we do is during the course of e-marking we not only put markers through a set of scripts that they have to pass, so they have to effectively prove that they can mark to standard, but during the course of their marking procedure, we will also seed, sub, seed um, mark scripts in there that they don't know are marked, and we will monitor their, their quality. So that's happened over the last few years, so there's, there's a significant increase in the quality monitoring of markers now than there was before. Just, just uh, my final question of this is, is picking up on one of the comments that was made is that the SQA has an annoying habit of making changes to assessments and examinations mid-session. That's obviously going to have an impact on, on results. Um, and also for making changes mid-session through, through halfway through the teaching, where it says here, uh, it was actually the higher history, important changes have been made to the way essays are marked in the final exam. For example, where essays were previously awarded four marks, blah, blah, blah. So they had to advise students to, the essays that they had written, which had previously been a pass, they would now lose marks for. So that, that's a fairly bold criticism of the... Of yeah, I, one of the things we we uh, learnt very early on is that we should absolutely limit the number of changes that we made during the session, and that was that was one of the things. That's that balance between responding to what teachers say is an issue and making changes. So we try and make all changes now at the at the, be, well before the start of the session, so teachers know what's going on. As we're moving into next session, the information around what the assessments will look like will be available to teachers in April, the end of April. That is our anticipated date. We haven't finished the planning yet, but that's what we're hoping for. That will be uh, just before the start of the next session. So uh, we, we very much focus on making sure that we don't make changes. And a guarantee that they will not change beyond that point, halfway through a teaching session. What, one of the things, the only time that that would happen is if there's something that makes it completely and utterly invalid. And, and that's not something that we are anticipating because, as I said, the course is not changing. Thank you. Okay, can I just come in on the back of that then? The, the, not just the quality of markers, but do you sometimes have a shortage of markers and then are seeking markers nearer the time where they're, they're needed? Um, yes, um, I, and in I, fact, the last session we saw that. Can I ask, I mean, given that you would have a rough idea of how many students would be sent in exams, why you don't have a pool earlier so that that situation doesn't arise? We do have a pool. Um, the issue that we have is the fact that uh, we are seeing an increase in the requirement for markers. So whilst we have 15,000, we might need 16,000 next year or 16,500. So that's about uh, recruiting and training um, new markers in that particular space. So we already, I mean, we're already in the process of recruiting markers now for next year. So it, it is a year-round activity, and, and a lot of people are very actively wanting to get engaged with SQA in this space. But you couldn't have been doing that last year if you were uh, towards the end of the session. You were still finding yourself struggling for markers, and you must have had a rough idea of the, the complexity and the, the need for more markers. Right? Yes, we did. There were some markers that pulled out last year, a small number of markers pulled out. And if that's, if that's a challenge in a particular subject... Uh, you, you will see specific subjects which are particularly small subjects or niche subjects where um, we are struggling for markers in, in certain places and those are the spaces that we looked at. And what we do there is we work with schools, we work with adders and we, we actively look at how we can make sure that everything is, is covered and that's what we did last year. Okay, thank you. Uh, I move on now to Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, can I just say, first of all, I was very relieved when, in response to Ross Greer, you said that you were not just a focus on the good news. Um, and I would ask that you, if it's possible, following this session, you actually look again at the submissions that have come in and respond in detail to some, I think, with some pretty serious uh, questions there. I want to ask a bit about the quality of the current system and you know, talk about the budget pressures on you. I think you've identified some of those. You've made a number of decisions which presumably are partly education and partly because of budget pressures. Can I ask you how many state schools have taken the opportunity to put in what's not longer called an appeal, whatever it's the term you used? How many state schools have used that? Um, for, for last year, um, for th sorry, for 13-14, um, we had um, 
6,901 state schools, request, uh, request from state schools. And independent schools? Uh, 1,369. We provided this information, I think, to the committee at the end of the last session. Okay. Again, we'll be very happy to provide that when we result... When, when so the you've tested this proposal against issues of equity and justice and an equal imp impact assessment? Um, we have because it is for the schools and the local authorities to decide how they um, allocate the fees. Right. So it's not an issue for the SQA that local authority schools may not have the means to access the justice or the, the confidence in the system that independent schools have. That's not an issue for the SQA. Um, the, the SQA is concerned that what we provide is an, an equitable, valid system. Um, the way in which it is accessed is a matter for other people. And you have no view on whether there is a difference between the access of resource of an independent school and a local authority which has no money? We talk to local authorities on a regular basis to, as to whether or not they believe that they should be... Um, they, they are limited in, in the post-result services they're putting in. I think one of the things that will be interesting to look at this session is the relative performance of the requests that have come in from private and independent, school, independent okay. schools and the state sector. On the question of um, national force and the decision that there should be simply a pass or a fail, I said to you earlier that I was a, a school teacher during the implementation of the standard grades, and the most powerful thing that was decided then, in my view, was certification for all. And part of my working life was getting young people from foundation to general. Do you accept that the new proposal undermines entirely the valuing of that group of young people? The, as I said at the beginning in my opening statement, the design and nature of the qualifications was agreed with the CFE management team. The philosophy of National 4 was very much that that would be a progression pathway for candidates who would ultimately leave and go potentially to college. Uh, the use of internal assessment and a pass-fail was associated with that philosophy. What we are doing at this point in time is we are going out and actively soliciting uh, feedback from SMT, fr from senior management teams in schools, from teachers themselves and from pupils and from employers as to the value of National 4 and, what, uh, and whether that should be a pass-fail whether it should be internally assessed, etc., because it is a conversation that absolutely needs to be had. And the assessment and national qualifications group that the Deputy First Minister leads are also looking at that and will be discussing that at its meeting in January. Mm -hmm. It is a very important area. I totally agree with you. So you would agree with Professor Lindsay Patterson, for example, has given evidence to the committee who's expressed grave concerns about the implications of what now... Um, is expected around uh, national force, around inclusion, opportunity, closing the attainment gap? I think that's, that's a, that is an area that we absolutely, as a, as a system, definitely not just SQA, need to look at and discuss and decide what we want to do with. Okay, the totally two other agree. areas that I want to um, just highlight, presumably around budget decisions. Decision to remove, um, as EIS highlights, um, human scribes and support for people with additional support needs. Again, I work with young people who were exceptionally bright, um, who were able but needed support through scribing, either a, a person with them writing what they said or reading the paper to them. You no longer do that. We do that for all subjects with the exception of where literacy component is included. And that was a particular... because So the scribes are, are there for all other subjects, absolutely. The, the issue here was if you have a qualification that includes a literacy literacy certification, it was important that we were able to do that. What we did in that particular case associated with uh, the, the literacy edition was to go around to each of the individual schools and understand what their concerns were. Because the assessments are internally assessed, the candidates have a lot more flexibility in the nature of the assessment that they undertake and the time in which it's undertaken. And we worked very hard to make sure that we absolutely did not have issues associated with that for special needs candidates. This is also an issue that's been highlighted by the EIS, so it would be useful perhaps you could provide us more detail with what yes, the technicalities are that, because that. we would be gravely concerned, I think, I that young people weren't able to access um, examinations absolutely. because of a budgeting decision to remove... No, it was not absolutely... Can I just... Sorry, can I just yeah, say yeah. it absolutely was not a budgetary decision and the scribes are, are there for other subjects. Okay. Um, I think we would all agree that in the last period, the SQA's period of transition, really, really important in terms of education. Can you explain why, according to EIS's figures, there's been a 500% increase in certification beyond Scotland since 2010? 
One of the things that uh, we talked about a little bit earlier was that if we can generate a surplus associated with the work outside of Scotland, and if we are supporting Scottish Government's international agenda with the positioning of education on the international stage, then one of the things we should be doing is, is doing international work, and that is associated with that. With, with respect to positioning ourselves on the international stage, by diluting the support and capacity of the organisation to deliver in Scotland, I wouldn't have thought that's terribly good for our reputational damage, but would you accept, at least as EIS suggests, and I find very compelling, that there must be a dilution of your concentration on the, your main job around Scottish education if there's that level of certification externally? No, um, there is not. We, we, we look at this very specifically and we allocate uh, resources associated with international work that are not resources that could be put in, in place in Scotland. But the committee needs to remember also that we undertake qualifications in vocational qualifications in colleges. We uh, deliver qualifications in training providers, in uh, industry sectors, in private companies across Scotland for the benefit of the learners of Scotland. What we're doing is using that expertise and that, um, that, that knowledge to be able to, to provide an income base a profit base that allows us to do more in Scotland. It is not about using resources that could be applied to Scottish activities. Well, I'm, I'm very well aware of the range of areas where the SQE has a role, but I go back to the point that the resources, at least to explain, where does this resource come from to deliver 500% increase in 2010 in external qualifications if it's not coming from your core provision? It's we entirely... We add additional provision, and that provision is paid for by the income that we generate, and the profit is also generated. But did you recognise there are a concern among some people Absolutely. that SQ has become an organisation that has a business model which creates incentive to sell abroad or beyond Scotland, and the danger is that you're not focusing on the day job? That is... Uh, all I can tell you is that that is not the case. Our major focus, the major activity that we are currently undertaking is curriculum for excellence. The other thing we absolutely need to make sure that we do not lose sight of is our requirement by statute to support the vocational space in Scotland as well. Those are our two major priorities. The other aspect is there to try and ensure that we can continue to do that over the long term. And final, final point on this question of National Ford and what I think is an utter injustice towards a whole range of young people who no longer have external certification. There's a real fear we'll go back to the days of non-certification, certificated classes, I taught, and no resources followed it because there was no external examination. When will there be a conclusion to the work that you're talking about in terms of the impact or an assessment of actually how that's playing out now in terms of National Four and the aspirations of young people? As I said, that, it, that is part of the discussion that Deputy First Minister is leading at the Assessment of the National Qualification Group, and I'm not aware of that timetable. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, let's move forward with Tavish Scott. Uh, Dr Brown, could I ask you about some further comments that came through uh, the Royal Society papers, uh, Mark Priestley's papers, and also Lindsay Patterson's papers? Um, I, th I think, that if I can sum it up, I think that there are questions as to whether the current uh, national qualification structure at S4 is compromising subject choice um, and therefore compromising the ability of pupils to study the core subjects that require uh, university entrance and the, and the quality that goes around that. Um, Professor Priestley makes the remark that there's a lack of dialogue about what is learned in schools and why. Official documents have tended to focus on skills rather than on knowledge. And it, our research suggests an absence of this sort of dialogue in schools. And I think they're all drawing a conclusion that there's a serious issue about the curriculum for excellence in its delivery, that subject choice is being compromised, and therefore that is leading to further problems uh, in colleges and universities. Do you agree with these comments? I, I think there's, there's, there's two aspects to that. One is, what is SQA's role in that space? SQA, as I said at the beginning, our job is to ensure that we provide a course and a subsequent qualification that builds on what that learner has achieved and takes them to the point that they can move to the next level. So there is a fixed uh, amount of content about both knowledge and skill and the application and the understanding that needs to go into that, into that course, uh, and that creates a certain size. 
Uh, the nature of how that is applied within a school is a matter for that school, for that local authority in consultation with parents and, and, and learners. Um, the, the, um, the way in which broad general education prepares a candidate for that qualification, I think, has an impact on this as well. There, as, as we talked at the beginning, part of the philosophy of curriculum for excellence was that we would, we would get away with the two-term dash. So if a candidate was, was absolutely going to get a hire, that they would work straight to a hire. And if they were a candidate that was better suited to a National 5 or a National 4, they would walk towards those qualifications. And I think that is, that is an area that is still a topic for debate across the country. Uh, notwithstanding the, the fact that it's not your decision to d say what courses are taught in schools, that's not for SQA to decide that. Have you had discussions, however, <clears throat> about the concerns which you have raised, not just today, but before, <clears throat> that the, there is a squeeze on the number of subjects as a result of the curriculum for excellence which pupils can opt into, and that is seen by many parents and indeed by some local authorities and by schools themselves that it is compromising the choices that they make uh, in terms of university entrance. Is, is that a concern that you have as Chief Executive of SQE? And have you had discussions about that with Education Scotland, with the other educational bodies? I think that's one of the conversations that Scotland as a whole needs to have. And yes, there has been many conversations about what is what are we trying to achieve with uh, the outcomes at the end of the senior phase? One of the, one of the issues, I think, that, that has... Um, that is, that has been tried to be addressed by Insight, for instance, the, the, the measurement tool that the Scottish Government has put in place, is that actually we should not be thinking about the number of qualifications at the end of a particular year, but at the end of the candidate's time at school. Uh, and I think the practicalities of that is something that needs to be thought through. Just, just to add uh, the points that Joanne Lament made about uh, youngsters who might end up with, you know, with nothing. Um, and on top of that, there seem to be concerns about those who are doing the qualifications that, the, that their subject choice, which is so crucial to what they're going to do after school, is being compromised because of the way the system is being run. Is that, when you say it's a conversation that ought to be had, is it, I, I would hope it has already been had because, you know, parents and pupils and um, staff are, are asking about this now because of the seriousness of it. And I think, you know, it's been brought home by constituents who tell us that, you know, in one school in, you know, might be 10 miles away from another school, um, that they're offering fewer subjects than they are in the other school, yet there's no sort of rhyme nor reason for that. That surely is a concern that SQA must have, even if you're not entirely responsible for it happening. I think, I think we should all be concerned, and we are concerned about positive destinations for students. And, and I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that we, we... I'm not privy to all of the conversations that occur in this space, because, it, because as I, I, I sound like I'm copying out, sorry. Um, but it, isn't our, it, it, is, it, is not, um, it is not part of our remit, but we do input into those conversations when we are available. And I accept what you're saying. I think, I think that's true, that it's not, not for you to dictate that. But are you not concerned that there is this disjointed approach? Because it, it is something that needs a joined up approach in terms of uh, the ability of youngsters to choose their courses and be examined in them, which is, obviously is your re remit. Mm -hmm. And you know, these uh, professors uh, in, in education, highly experienced people, are making the point, quite rightly in my opinion, that the subject choice approach is not comparable with the statement about broad general education, that it's, it's condensing the ability of these students to have a well-rounded education, particularly in what they go on to choose. And that's something that I think is hitting right at the, you know, very strong traditions, let's be honest, of what Scottish education has been able to deliver in the past. This subject choice issue is becoming a big problem for curriculum for excellence. Is that correct? I think it's a topic that is, is increasingly being discussed. And, and, and I think... Is it a problem, Dr Brown? Um, some candidates need... A lot of subjects. Other candidates are ill-served by a lot of subjects. And one of the philosophies of Curriculum for Excellence was that the schools should be the best place to discuss that. Um, I, I, and, I, and all I can say is that the teachers should be the ones. Now, the, the challenge is in a school sector is are the teachers actually able to do that? Are they given the flexibility to do that? Or what are the other constraints on the system? Okay, thank you.
Yeah, thank you. But the point there is, is it not, that what, again, what the submissions say on this very same point of, that Liz Smith is raising is that the SQA recommends 160 hours teaching and assessment time for their courses, which is one of the, the submissions says, which is impossible to achieve in a single year. Isn't that the concern? So the building block that you've been answering is your requirement, forgive me, it may not be your yeah. requirement, but your requirement for 160 hours in one year, for 160 hours. Yeah, I, and, and that's what I was, that, that's absolutely true. What we're trying to do is take someone from the, the position that they're at at the end of broad general education and take them to the point that they can get uh, they can get entry into their next level. That has a specific requirement associated with the, with the amount of knowledge, the amount of understanding, the amount of skills development. That is what defines the, the size of the course. It, yes, we could have ha a half size course, and I think if you think in England, you have the A-level and you have the AS, actually no longer in England, but, but you have something halfway mm. between. If you want to get the full course, you have to have that amount of knowledge, learning, and understanding. And our anticipation in those notional learning hours is that an average candidate would take approximately that amount of time to do it. It is, it is therefore um, appropriate that I think some, that, that schools allow that amount of time to do it. If you're trying to do all of that in one year, you are limiting the Absolutely. number of subjects that you can do. But that's the reality of it, isn't it? That's what's happening right across every school I've talked about. Uh, or you are actually um, giving courses with as little as 90 hours of learning. Mm -hmm. And that is a real challenge, both in terms of workload yeah. for teachers, because teachers are now not just teaching one 90 hour, they're teaching multiple yeah. 90 hours, yeah. but there are, also, uh, there are also huge issues for learners uh, associated with that and Absolutely. the amount of information they're trying to... And at the other end gather. of that, no, I agree with that. And the other end of that surely is that, uh, you'll, you'll tell me, but I don't think there's a school in Scotland teaching three sciences in one, in one year, is there? So all those kids who are good enough to do this because they want to go and do a science degree at university, and that's, I appreciate your earlier point, it's only a small percentage, they can't do it. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I, just... I think there are some schools teaching three sciences in one year. So you still can do it? Yes. And how do we know, who keeps a record of these things? How do, how do we find this kind of thing out? Th that, again, we, we, don't, we don't collect that but no information. One does I, I don't know whether Education Scotland does. No, they don't. We've asked them that question too. And so we don't know, is my... I think, I think the challenge here is, you know, what we need to be doing um, is making sure that candidates are given the appropriate level and the appropriate time for learning, teaching, and the requirement for assessment that they need to be able to be successful in that course of, of qualification and be successful in terms of the amount of learning they've got to make them successful in, the, in their destination. It's not just passing the hurdle of getting the qualification. Okay, can I ask, I'm not sure I fully understood that, but anyway, can I ask one final question? Um, in all your evidence today about um, workload, the committee has cited the papers to you. Um, you said that, uh, and I'm sure this is true, that you, the SQA meet the Education Scotland and all these other organisations regularly. Uh, do you ever get together and say, look, together, this is what we are doing to schools? Yes. Do you? Really? Yes. Well, what, why then have we had all these submissions like this, and why, comparably, when we see Education Scotland, there's a sim similar number of vast submissions saying, uh, going through 1,800 E's and O's and the changes to benchmarks, which have just come out again? Do you not get together and sit and say, right, you're doing this, you're doing that? Well, how do we ease this pressure on schools and teachers? Yes, and that is why we put out the subject review reports, because prior to being asked to remove the units, we recognised that our units were having a very detrimental effect so on schools, in the year's and time we tried budget, to address it. In the year's time, when we won't be receiving 142 pages or whatever Joanne Lamont was citing at us <laughs> on all this again, and similarly with Education Scotland, it'll all be smoothed out no, for next year. No, well, we don't wrong. know, because we now are in, on a path of removing units, and we need to... So we're not going to t follow through with what the subject review reports... Uh, requested because those are very heavily focused on units. We're now no longer doing units, mm -hmm. so we will um, we will have, I think, feedback on the changes that yeah. we're implementing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Feedback. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we had two other subject matters: quality assurance and accountability and governance, but they seem to have been covered in the in the previous questions. Does anybody else have any contributions they'd like to make before I round up? Daniel, very briefly. Yeah, I just really want to come back on... You, you said to Ross Thompson's question that it's important not... To, and Joanne Man, uh, Lamont mentioned this as well. It's important not to just focus on the positives. But then you didn't really provide any explanation on the negatives. And I, and I think, as Tavish just pointed out, it's not usual for us to have this volume. 
And just without reference to your current processes, I think most of your answers you've talked about your feedback and current processes. In just broad, simple terms, why do you think there's this very substantial and significant, regardless of whether it's majority or not, of teachers who seem to have lost confidence in you? And what, again, in broad, simple terms, are you going to do to fix that? Because I think that's what this committee needs to hear today. I think a lot of the uh, negative views are associated with the way in which the qualifications have been um, designed, implemented and um, have worked. What we have done is try and we continue to try and understand why they have not worked the way we anticipated they would work and we need to make sure that we remove the problems that we have created as a result of those designs. With, with respect, is that not a pretty damning statement? If it's, no, it's an the way that the, your, that the exams are designed and delivered, isn't that what the SQA is for? And if you failed in that, isn't that a pretty significant statement? Well, um, again, um, one of the things that we tried to do with our research was understand the root causes, and I use the word causes as to why they haven't worked. There are aspects that are in SQA's uh, remit and, and, and in our responsibility to address. My responsibility, I believe, to Scotland is to tell people when we have not got something right, because I think that's the way that we should improve. We, uh, in introducing any new qualification from any awarding body anywhere, you learn what is practical and how things are actually operating in schools. We've had a lot of discussion about the nature of the curriculum and the nature of how things are operating in schools. There were other reasons why the assessments were not working properly. I cannot address them. All I can do is highlight them. Um, all I can do is address the issues that the assessments themselves have caused. And in my opinion, that is something that SQA should be sharing because we should learn from the things that we I had assumed would work. Yes, we had conversations with teachers. Yes, we thought this would the, the feedback that we got would be that this would work. It has not in certain cases, not across the board. The, the qualifications are absolutely not uh, a, a, a problem in general. There were issues associated with aspects of the unit assessment. The course assessments were all fine. And that was the feedback that we got from our field work. I really just wanted to reflect that this has been a, evidently a very challenging evidence um, session for yourselves. And, and, it, and I think you'll, you'll respect that it has to be that way because um, as a committee we've got a job to scrutinise and to make sure that um, things are as best as they can be. Um, I don't think I was lost on following on from the visit last week, which is why I wanted to kind of come back in because I did visit and I, and I would say to other members as well that um, you know, to take the opportunity to visit uh, if you get a chance and to see the, the, the amount of work that you're doing. And what I seen last week was a, a group of people who were um, dedicated, um, who are proud of where Scotland sits educationally and are wanting to make a difference. And I think that, that we need to hold on to that. So what I would ask you to do is take away what you've heard today around the table, take away the submissions that have been put in, and when you're doing your field work and your other assessments, is to be honest about it and, and you know, come back next year um, or whenever, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll have another more positive discussion around the table if you're able to do that. And I, I just wanted to kind of reflect on that. OK, Could thanks very much. Do you want to respond to that? Uh, can I just say thank you for that? Because um, the one thing you notice about the SQA when you walk in it, sorry, is everybody cares passionately about the learners of Scotland. And um, we do not like it when we don't do it right. Absolutely don't. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time, evidence. That was over two hours. Um, one thing that I would say is, is, and it's clear from the evidence that we've had today, no matter what the changes are next year, and you're right, there will be feedback, there's going to be changes, that's the way it should be. But there's two things that we shouldn't be getting the same response on, and that is your relationship with teachers and the communication that you have with teachers and parents. You should at least be able to make sure that you're communicating whatever changes are required and the need for them to the organisations in a manner that everybody can understand, because that does still seem this, this year to be a, a, an ongoing problem. But once again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.
then that closes the public session.